All right, uh, take your Bible tonight and uh, turn to, uh, just open it. <laughs> just, just open your Bible. You got your Bible open, say amen. amen. All right, let's, let's go to the Lord and prayer. We got to begin right. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray tonight that you would just open up our hearts tonight. I pray that you would uh, open up our understanding and Father, I pray that you would help us to uh, uh, change our hearts to match your book. Lord, help us to change our attitude to match your book. And Father, we look from your book to guide and direct us in your spirit to uh, show us the way we ought to go. And Lord, if there's anybody here tonight that's lost on the road to hell... Lord, I pray that you'd open up their eyes. I pray that you'd open up their heart and help them see the truth and ho help them to trust in the precious blood of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross of Calvary for them. Lord, may tonight be that night that their attitude changes toward Jesus Christ. And Father, please do the work that must be done in our midst tonight. In Jesus' precious name I pray, and for his sake, amen. All right, I really don't know where to begin. I'm just going to begin uh, trying to explain it to you as best I know how. Years ago, 30 years ago, I was uh, under Dr. Ruckman's ministry, and he would always have sayings that he would have. He had sayings. And through the years, I have picked up sayings from him and picked up sayings from all other kind of preachers that I meet. And uh, I'd, in my church... I got uh, Bob, uh, Bob Jones Sr.'s sayings. How many of you have uh, uh, come in contact with some of his sayings? Raise your hand. Put your hand up if you had contact. Well, that's quite a few of you. I'll have over on this wall over here. Now, if you haven't really got contact with him, you need to pay attention tonight. And some of the others, you need to write them down and meditate on them. Finish the job. Finish the job. That's Bob Jones Sr. Finish the job. What do you mean by that? He meant, finish the job. So many folks don't finish the job. They start, but they don't finish. Then I'd meditate upon that, and I'd be putting up molding in the church, and I'd have all the molding up except one piece of molding right over here. <laughs> right there would be a piece of molding. And months and months and months, and it went by years. <laughs> and something says, finish the job. <laughs> so I'd put the piece of molding up. Amen? Amen. Finish the job. A lot of folks go to college. They get started. Got a good start. They don't finish. Go all four years, man. Go all four years to finish the job. Finish the job is, is laid on my heart time and time again. That's why I've been in the same church for 25 years. Finish the job. By Bob Jones Sr. Another one Bob Jones Sr. gives is a light at the it's the light at the bottom of the stairs that counts. It's the light at the bottom of the stairs that counts. And I, I heard that saying for years, but it never dawned on me what that really meant. And I'd meditate on it quite often, but it, it didn't go off like a light. The light was off as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and then one day, he said, it's a light at the bottom of the stairs that count. And I went over to a lady's house from a church there, and I said, Burl, how did you break your arm? She said, Preacher, I went down the stairs, and as I went down the stairs, the light was out. I said, the light at the bottom of the stairs. She said, the light was out, and I missed the step, and I fell and broke my arm. And then I said, Lord, it's the light. And he said, we are the light of the world. And he says, you're only a 40-watt bulb down at the bottom of the stairs. Make sure you shine. Did you get it? Did you get it? You're a 40-watt bulb. And you only got a few people to shine to. Make sure you shine to the ones God given you. You ain't no chandelier. You'll never be a chandelier. Forget the chandelier. But you can sure be a 40-watt bulb at the bottom of the stairs. Bob Jones Sr. had many of those sayings, tons and tons of them. And I would meditate them on through the year, and so did Dr. Ruckman. And over 30 years ago, Dr. Ruckman gave me this. Now I want you to take and write it down. 
And I meditated upon it, and I believe it's a great truth. You say, well, it's not the Bible. Yes, but it sure is biblical. It, he said, life is 10% what happens to you. Life is 10% of what happens to you. And 90% how we respond to it. The name of my message tonight is, What is your attitude? People get an attitude. And that particular attitude is going to determine every crisis in their life. Because the attitude is going to determine how the crisis turns out. What kind of attitude do you have? Attitude determines crises in your life. Now, let me give you an illustration. Take your Bible and turn to Genesis. And this is a man with a particular attitude. Turn to Genesis chapter 4. We talked about this before, uh, but it doesn't hurt to uh, bring it to your mind again. Uh, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 6. Here's a man with an attitude. He's got an attitude. You ever hear anybody say he's got an attitude? That's true whether it's negative attitude, and that's true whether it's a positive attitude, and that's true regardless of what kind of attitude he has. Now here's a man with an attitude. Genesis chapter 4, and pick up verse 6. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou rash? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be, what's that next word? Accepted. Here's the situation. Cain has brought all his food and put it up on the stand and he's praying. And Abel has brought the blood of the lamb and he's put it on the altar also. And the fires come down and burn up Abel's offering. And Cain's offering was not even touched. And Cain looks over and sees the sacrifice being accepted by God, and he got so mad, said his countenance. The countenance is your face. The countenance is how folks are looking at you. The, this, this part right up here. It, well, he wasn't going, no, nah, no. Nah. He's over there and he's going, oh, I could hate him, I could hate him. I could hate him, I could hate him, I could hate him, I could hate him. I could hate him. Well, why did God say, why is thy countenance fallen? He's given that boy a chance to have the right attitude. He said, now look what he says right in the verse. He says, uh, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. He could have right that very second said, I think I'll go get me a lamb. I think, I think, well, if he got accepted with the lamb, I think I could just get accepted with the lamb. I'm going to go get me a lamb. Amen. And he brought lamb back and said, Lord, I'm no, gooder, I'm no better than anybody else. Amen. And here's my lamb. Will you accept my lamb? Amen. You know what God would have done? God would have said, I will accept your lamb. But that wasn't the attitude. His attitude, when he got to with the thing, he killed his brother and he got a curse because of his attitude. Now, take your Bible, turn to Genesis 15. Turn to Genesis chapter 15 and pick up verse 1. Here's a man with an attitude. Genesis chapter 15. And look at verse 1. Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not. Abram, I am a shield, an exceeding great reward. Abram said, Lord God, wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born to my house is my heir. What's Abraham praying about, folks? 
He's praying about what anybody want to pray about. He doesn't have any children. Come on, how many of you have children? Raise your hand this evening. You got children. Aren't you glad you have children? Aren't you in your heart? Aren't you going saying, thank God, God give me some children. God give me some children. God give me some children. Oh, thank God, God give me some children. Suppose you was 90 years old or more and you didn't have any children. What would your attitude be? Wouldn't it be kind of disappointing in God? Take Abraham's position and say, Lord, I'm so disappointed. The heir of my house is Eleazar. I got a grandchild. His name's Andy. <laughs> Man, I love that boy. Ha, I just, I come over here and I say, Andy, 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 Andy. Don't you, don't, don't you think Abraham had an attitude? Because God hadn't given him any children. Now, with that in mind, look what it says in verse 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thy heir, but he that shall come forth out of thy bowels shall be thy heir. Abraham, when did it, how old was Abraham when he finally had uh, Isaac? That's an old man, ain't it? Come on, folks. He's way up there. All right. And he, and he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven. He said, Come out of the tent, Abraham, and look up. Abraham walks out the tent looks right straight up. And tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said to him, So shall thy seed be. And he said, Abraham, count the stars. Abraham looks up and says, Why, Lord, there's a slug of them. It's on a clear night. No clouds. I mean, no lights from the city. Out there in a the tent. No city lights. Boy, he could see a lot of stars. And then the Lord says, So shall thy seed be. Watch his attitude. This guy's got an attitude, boy. Watch it. Watch what it is. Verse 6. And he believed in the Lord. Wow! <laughs> oh, ain't that a shot? Abraham's look up and he says, Okay, Lord, if you said my seed shall be as the stars of heaven, I believe what you said. You said it, I believe it. Wow, what an attitude. When that man says that to God Almighty, God looks down and Abraham becomes the friend of God. The friend of God. Man, what a thing. Amen. Wouldn't you want to be the friend of God? Pa, say, Brother Bemis, would you like to be the friend of God Almighty? Woo would I like to be the friend of God Almighty? What'd he do? He had an attitude. When that guy said that, God looked down and said, I'm going to make the nation of Israel. And they're going to go forever and ever and ever and they're going to inherit the entire world because of my friend. I got a friend and his name is Abraham. How important is an attitude? I tell you, it's pretty important. It's okay, God. I believe that. What did it say in the rest of it? And it accounted to him for what? For Righteousness. Righteousness. Oh, for the right attitude. Take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38. Uh, if I can just instill in you the right attitude that you ought to have. Folks mess up because they got the wrong attitude. Look at Genesis chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38 and pick up verse 19. Genesis chapter 38 and verse 19, 38. Let's go, let's pick up, uh, uh, let's pick up, uh, well, verse 24. Genesis 38, verse 24. And it come to pass about three months after that it was told Judah. Now take your pen and underline the word Judah. Judah is one of the 12 tribes of Israel, but he's just a man at the time, saying, 
Tamor, thy, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot. Underline the word played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And everybody knows what that is. And Judah said, bring her forth and let her be burned. That's keeping, that would be the correct thing under the Mosaic law. You burn them both. Under the Le Levitical law, you burn them both. Verse 25. And when she was brought forth, she sent her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, am I with child? And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose these are, the signet and the bracelet and the staff. And Judah, now I want you to look at this attitude. Here's a man that is caught dead cold in sin. If you understand the passage, say amen. amen. You sure ought to understand the passage. It's going on in America. It happens all the time. You folks ought to know all about that. You ought to probably know somebody personally. Quite a regular thing nowadays. But watch this guy's attitude. Watch his attitude. Verse 26. And Judah acknowledged him and said, She hath been more righteous than I. Now you say, what is that? that, that now what could he have said? You, you know what I've heard folks say? <laughs> Well, preacher, everybody else does it. What's a guy doing when he's saying everybody else doing it? He's trying to justify his wickedness. His attitude is his attitude could have been. Well, you, you, you know, you know, she deceived me. His attitude could have been all kinds of things to justify his sin. You know what they said? She said, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty. You know what he could have said? He could have said, that's not my sin, that's not mine, that don't belong to me, that is not mine, burn her. He could have, and he'd have probably got away with it. But that's not what he does. He just says, in his heart, he says, well, I can't lie. I have to own up to this thing. I can't lie. I've got to tell the truth. It's mine. And when he does that, God Almighty is watching the whole situation. And God says, Hey, Gabriel, Gabriel, come here. Michael, come here. Look at Judah. Look at Judah. Look what Judah's done. He's telling the truth. And right there, Judah is one of the 12 tribes. And Judah becomes the lineage of Christ and it says in the book of, Le book of Revelation it says Jesus Christ is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. You know why? Because that old boy sat right there and says I cannot lie about it. Oh man alive. What an attitude. That's the kind of attitude you ought to have. Now, take your Bible again, turn to Genesis chapter 50. This is my introduction. I haven't even started yet. <laughs> Genesis chapter 50. And look at verse 19. Here's a man with an attitude. He's got an attitude, boy. Genesis chapter 50. There's all kinds of attitudes you can have. But this guy's got one. Genesis chapter 50. And in Genesis chapter 50... Who is the man in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 19? And Joseph. Does it say Joseph in the verse, folks? Joseph. Okay, now just read the name a minute and look back up at me. You remember the story of Joseph. Joseph is the fellow that went over there and he begins with his 12 brothers. And they're all around one day and his 12 brothers do what to him? They take him and beat him up and take his coat of many colors and throw him in a, in a pit. And put a little blood on that coat of many colors and go back home to daddy and tell him daddy's dead. 
Before they go back home, what do they do? They get to talking around there and get to say, well, we'll kill him, we'll kill him, we'll kill him, we'll kill him, we'll kill him. Don't you think he heard that in the pit? And when he's down in the pit, one of his other brothers comes along and says, boys, let's not kill him. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites that are coming through. And so they said, well, we'll make a few bucks on this. Okay, let's pull our younger brother up out of this and let's sell him to the Ishmaelites that are going down to Egypt. And say, sell Joseph to the Ishmaelites going down to Egypt. And where does Joseph end up down in Egypt, folks? He ends up down in prison. He's down there in prison. Now, before we read the rest of the verse, take your Bible and turn to Psalms 105 and look at verse 17. I want you to see something in Psalms 105, verse 17, because it has to do with Joseph's attitude. And he has that attitude all his life. Je uh, Psalms 105, Psalms 105, give you a second to see it. Psalms 105 and verse uh, 17. And it says, I sent a man before them, even who? Verse 17, who? Joseph. Psalms 105, verse 17, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they did what? They hurt with fetters and was laid in iron. Well, you know something? He gets down there. He's in prison. And they hurt his feet. They put it around there. And for at least two years, he's getting hammered. And what does Joseph do? Does Joseph have the attitude, I hate my brothers. I hate my brothers. They told me. And I'm down here in prison. And I hate them. And I hate them. And I hate them. And I'm never going to forget what you guys did to me. Is that his attitude? Now turn back to Genesis. And turn to Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50 again. And look at verse 19. Let's see Joseph's attitude from the time he was sold to the time he met his brothers. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. You know why I said fear not? Because they think this guy is the king over Egypt and he's running the whole show. He's liable to wipe us out, man. Daddy's dead, daddy's gone, and we're, oh, we're done for. So he says, fear not, for I am the place of God. But as for you, underline it, ye thought it evil against me. But, now watch his attitude, get his attitude. But God made it good, unto good to bring to pass the things of this day to save much people alive. You know what he said? He said, well, God just working the whole thing out for good, and it's okay because God was running the whole thing, and it's no problem, boys. I, I love you. What an attitude. Ha <laughs> ha! What an attitude! You know what some folks would do? Some folks would just go through and just say, I'm mad, I just can't stand it out. And I have an attitude that just won't quit. You know, it's like Dr. Ruckman said. 10% of what happens to you in life is what happens to you and 90% of it is how you respond to it. How do you respond to things that happen to you in life? What's your attitude? Now, I want to say this. There's four attitudes. There's four attitudes that you got to have in order to respond right to everything that happens in life. Four attitudes. And if you don't have these four attitudes to respond to things that happen to you in life, you'll respond the wrong way. Esau and Jacob. And Esau responded with bitterness. And Esau got a curse that lasted him and his seed for eternity. It's still here today. Esau! Because his attitude had a certain thing that God hated. What is your attitude? Number one, take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 and see, this is the first attitude that you've got to see and you've got to have it and you've got to write it down. 
If you want to write it in the right place, you take and you open up your Bible and you find a blank place in your Bible like I got right here. You open up and you say, attitude number one, put it right there. Because you've got to keep this on your heart all the mind, all the time. You've got to always have this attitude. It's a must. It's a must. And I see Christians, I've been living with Christians, I've been watching Christians, and every time I see one mess up, it's because they have the wrong attitude. They got an attitude about them. You can change your attitude. You can change it. God wants you to change it. Turn to Acts chapter 9 and look at verse 6. In Acts, now I, I got to get there a minute. Acts chapter 9. And in, in verse 6, it says, let's pick up verse 5. Let's pick up verse 4. Let's pick up verse 3. I'll get it in a minute. Acts 9, 3. And as he journeyed, he came into Damascus, and suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth. And heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, now take your pen and underline it. This is the attitude you got to have. Now do you have this attitude? Lord, what wilt thou have me to do. That's what you got to have, brother. That's the attitude you've got to get in your mind. Every time a situation comes in life, you come to a crossroads like this. Every one time it comes like that, then you got to say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? If you could have that attitude constantly all the time, you know what to do? It would save you problem after problem after problem. Because then what would you be doing? You'd be saying to the, you'd be saying to the Lord, uh, Lord, I, I, I want to please you. I don't want to please myself. I want to please you. How many of you would like to please the creator of the universe? That's going to be a job. That's going to be quite a, the creator of the universe that created everything on this world. Everything that was created was created by him. You ain't going to please him unless you work at it. It ain't going to be no just sliding doing it. You know what I want to do? I get up in the morning. I get up in the morning and I say, no, Lord, what can I do to please you? What can I do just to please you, just to make you happy? Just that you'll smile at and something that you'll just enjoy. Just something that you'll be pleased with. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Do you know what I think it's connected with? I think it's connected with the basic element of making God happy. Now take your Bible and turn to uh, 1 John chapter 3. Turn to 1 John. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Turn to 1 John chapter 3. And look at verse 22. 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. Now take your Bible and mark some things. You know, if a Christian will mark his Bible and put some lines on it, it'll make his Christian life so much different. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 22 says, And whatsoever we what? Ask. Underline it. And whatsoever we ask. What's that? That's praying. That's praying. That's going and getting down on your hands and knees and praying. You're asking when you're praying. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. That means God answers your prayer. How many of you have a prayer you'd like answered? Amen. Raise your hand. You have a prayer you'd like answered. Really. You'd really like it answered. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because... Now, he's saying, okay, I'll answer your prayer if... If what? Because, now watch it, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are what? Pleasing 
in his sight. Then you know what the Lord wants? By one of the Lord's commandments, I believe, is thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. So here's a Christian. He gets up in the morning and he says, Lord, I'm not going to take your name in vain. I'm not going to swear. I'm not going to cuss. No bad words are going to come out my mouth. Never anymore, no matter what happens today. Dennis, have you ever heard a Christian cuss? You've heard one cuss? You're around some men that'll cuss. <laughs> Aren't you? You probably heard a Christian cuss, haven't you? When it happened, didn't it down on the inside of your heart down in here? Didn't it just like a knife took and cut down in your heart when it happened? Christian, I'll tell you how to please the Lord. Don't you ever say those words ever again. Don't you ever say them ever again. You'll please God. You say, preacher, you didn't know I said them. No, but the Lord did. And the Lord is the one that's watching your attitude. I want to please him. I want to please him. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Now take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 12. Turn to Romans chapter 12. I believe that the right attitude of saying, Lord, what, thou, what wilt thou have me to do will bring about this. Turn to Romans. This is a great, great verse for a Christian. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and pick up verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you will present your body a what? Living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable what? Service. So you know what God wants? God wants a Christian to do what? Present his body as a living sacrifice. You know what it has to do with? Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? You know what it's like? I had this lady that I knew she was saved. She was born again. And she was God's child. And she would go into a place where they had gambling. Well, that's just about any place out in Montana. Montana, you can go about a block here, and there's a gambling joint, and another block, and here's another gambling joint, and another block, and here's another gambling joint, and gambling is every other block. Gambling, 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 gambling. She goes in, she pulls the one-armed bandlet, and the stuff comes around, and she oh, wins. So she goes, ha ha, I won! So she goes back, pulls the handle, and does it some more. Then pretty soon she's sitting in there, putting money in it, and 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 putting more money in it, and putting more money in it, and putting more money in it. And she sits there day after day after day after day after day till the word gets around back to me. She says, Preacher. You know what Mrs. So-and-so's doing? I says, is that right? I says, uh, she sure must be out of fellowship with God. I said, probably. A couple of days went by. Telephone rung. I pick up the telephone. She said, preacher, do you know what happened to Mrs. So-and-so? She dropped dead pulling the one-armed bandit. She dropped dead, pulling the one-armed bandit. So they call me in, and I go see her. She's in the casket laid out. And I said, Lord, she went home. But not the right way did she go home. I don't want to go home to glory pulling the one-armed bandit. I want to go home with glory sin. Repent of boys, turn and burn. Amen. If I go, brother, I want to go preaching on the street corner. I hope they shoot me right in the head. Because <laughs> I don't want to go and lay in the hospital and suffer for a long time. I want to go just like that. 
but I don't want to go pulling the one-armed bandit. Amen. You know something? If you're a Christian and you're wasting God's money, you know what you're doing? And you're going out there and God has given you the money that he's given you. Amen. Oh, yes, 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 yes! And he's made you a steward of that money! And if you're a steward of that money, you have to ask God how he wants you to spend it. Amen. And you say, well, preacher, it's my money. I made it. And if I want to waste it, I'll waste it. Well, when you get to the judgment, the Lord will say, I gave you a lot of money that you wasted. Now give account of your stewardship. And you will give account of your stewardship. You know what I do? I go to Kmart and I say, there's nothing in there I want. There's nothing in there I need. And there's nothing in there I want to spend my money on. I go to Walmart and I say, it's all just junk. And I have a hard time finding anything that's ju just junk. It's like the little girl said the other night, yes, we've got plenty of junk. <laughs> and that's what it is. We've got plenty of junk. I'll bet you've got plenty of junk. Make sure, make sure, brethren, Make sure that you spend the Lord's money right. It has to do with, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? That's an attitude. You ought to get that attitude. Next time you get in, in a situation where it's going to go this way or this way and your life is going to change, say to yourself in your heart, Lord, what wilt thou? Thou have me to do. And then let God direct you what you ought to do. And you forget about how you feel about it. Because your attitude will, well, huh? uh, I just can't hack this. I can't hack this. You've got the wrong attitude. Your attitude say, God, I can hack this. And if that's what you want me to hack, I will hack it. God wants some folks to just carry a cross. Yes, just to carry a cross. He said, take up thy cross daily. He also said, deny thyself and take up thy cross and follow me. Next time you bow your head, say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do. That's the right attitude. Now take your Bible and turn to Isaiah chapter 6, attitude number uh, 2. Isaiah chapter 6. In Isaiah chapter 6, look at verse 8. Now look, here's an attitude. And brother, if you can get this attitude and keep this attitude, you've got to have it. You've got to have it. And if you get this attitude and keep it and have it on your mind all the time, and it'll be part of you and have that attitude, it'll get you through any situation. When it comes there and it's going to be disaster for you, you'll be okay. Isaiah chapter 6. Do you want to be okay or do you want to get bombed out? Do you want to be in the garbage can upside down when the Lord comes back? Or do you want to be doing just a little bit of something for Him? And just a little bit of something for him. Amen. Okay, then, if that's the case, then you've got to have the right attitude. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8 says, As I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Now take this attitude and underline it. This is an attitude. Then said I, here am I, send me. He says, Lord, here am I, send me. You know what that's basically in life? Jesus Christ come to this earth to do what? To die for my sins and yours. That's what he came for came to die for my sins. You know what he wants more than anything else? He wants folks to get saved. He, if he died for them, now folks, if he died for them, how many believe he died for them? Say amen. amen. Now if he died for man's sins, 
He wants more than you and I want to see folks walk the aisle and get saved. He wants sinners to repent and come to Jesus. So the basic element of the right attitude for witnessing is one thing. Lord, hear my send me. Give you somebody good to witness to across your path. Do you know what I find? I find if you just wait until you go on visitation to witness, or if you just wait to get somebody saved at the altar up here, maybe there's some of you sitting back there and saying, well, as the second, the second that somebody walks that aisle, and I'm going to get a chance to come down here and pray with them and lead them to the Lord. Now, how, how many of you have done that in this church? Raise your hand. Say amen. Do you lead them all to the Lord yourself, brother? <laughs> Somebody leads them to the Lord, don't you? See what I'm saying? Or do they get saved into the back room? Somebody leads them to the Lord, don't they? Let me ask you. When's the last time somebody walked down this aisle and got saved? I'm going to interrupt myself. When's the last time somebody walked down this aisle and got saved? Has it been weeks? Months? You say, what's the problem? You've got to get a sinner in here. You've got to get a sinner in here. Does he preach the gospel? Does he preach the gospel? Then if you get a sinner in here, and he gives an invitation, the sinner can come forward. But if you don't get no sinner in here, how do you think a sinner is going to get saved? Think about it a minute, man. Think about it a minute. How many of you would shout if somebody walked the aisle tonight? Amen. Say amen. amen. You, if you didn't shout out loud, you'd at least out shout in your heart. Say amen. amen. Sure you do. Inside you want to say, I want him to get saved. I want him to get saved. I want him to get saved. Oh God, I want him to get saved. The basic element of witnessing is, Lord, hear am I. Hear am I. Send me. Do you know what a preacher wants more than anything else? Anything else. If I know his heart like I know my own heart, and I believe it's not far off, he wants more than anything else. He wants to see some sinner get up out of the seat right back there and walk down this aisle and kneel at that altar and trust Jesus Christ. He'd go home and go, ha ha, somebody got saved, somebody got saved. I guess somebody got saved this morning. They got saved this morning. Ha ha, they got saved. He'd go for weeks on that. He'd go months on it. That's what keeps you going. That's what gets you through. It's a life for this church. It's the life of it. That means you have got to invite some sinner. Do you know what's wrong? You know what's the great thing about you preaching on the street, Dennis? The sinners are all out there. Sinners are all out there. You know how hard it is to get a sinner to come to this church? A Bible-believing... I'm going to a Bible-believing church. Oh, I know. Oh, I got the, the, the preacher I might preach at me. Boy, I may tell you, it's going to be hard. It ain't going to be an easy job to get a sinner in this church. No, it ain't going to be easy. But that's why your attitude ought to be, Lord, give me somebody that I could get to go to church with me and see him get saved. Because all those people want somebody to see somebody walk that out so bad they could scream. How many of you have been praying about it? Raise your hand. See that? There's several of you praying about it. There's, that's over half of you praying about it. That's where it ought to be. You ought to say, Lord, here am I. Send me. That's God sent. You know what keeps me going as a preacher? Knowing that God sent me. Wouldn't you be like to be God sent? Ever one of you? Like to be God sent? Then you've got to have that attitude. By the grace of God, you will. Now take your Bible and turn to uh, the next one, Luke chapter 22, verse 42. And here's an attitude. Luke chapter 22, verse 42. Saying, Father, 
If thou wilt be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, now watch the attitude. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine being done. Now take your pen and underline it. Luke chapter 22, verse 42. Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, up there, right before he's crucified. And he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane and he says, If thou will, remove this cup from me. You know what he's praying about? He's praying about a cup. And the cup is the wrath of God on sin. And Jesus Christ is about to drink the cup. And the cup is, is actually sin and God the Father's wrath on it. And Jesus Christ says, if I drink this cup, then I have to be connected with every man's sin in the face of this earth. And if I drink that cup, I have to take their sins and I have to die for their sins, but I have to become sin. And the Father's wrath will be on it. And he said, Lord, if there's, Father, if there's any other way, if there's any other way for you to pay for man's sins, can you find it? And then he goes back and prays it and prays it. And after the third time, he prays what? Here's an attitude. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Christian, if you can get that attitude as a Christian and pray, Lord, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. You know what you'll solve? You'll solve every, uh, every controversy that you ever get into. You'll come out with the right attitude because you'll say, you're getting an argument, you're getting a fuss. And oh, we all have arguments and we all have fusses. Hey Amen. That's just part of life. And getting an argument and getting a fuss. And then you'll say, not my will, not my will, Lord, but thy will be done. And man, I lie. What an attitude you'll have for God Almighty. Can you see it? Can you see it? And the Lord says, Man, with a guy like that, with a guy like that, I'll just take care of him. So what does he do with his son? He raises him from the dead. He raises him from the dead. And he's forever living. He's not dead anymore. It's like in my church. My church, I had a picture. I had a picture. And put a picture right up here on this wall here. And the picture was Jesus Christ dying on the cross of Calvary. And a bunch of folks would come in and say, He's dead. And then walk out the door. And then a few more people come in and say, He's dead. And walk out the door. And one morning I was preaching and I say, He ain't dead. He's alive. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He died, but he rose from the grave. He's alive. I went and took that picture down. I said, it's not going up anymore. It's not going up anymore. Because Jesus Christ is alive. Now, brethren, will you have the attitude of saying, not my will, but thy will being done. You know what it's like? It's like saying, well, okay, Lord, Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to them love God, to them recall according to his purpose. And you say, how's that? All things work together for good. When you do that. You say, preacher, what about this? Yep, that too. What about that thing over there? That too. And everything you name works together for good when you say, not my will, but thy will be done. Last of all, here's an attitude. Take your Bible and turn to the uh, book of Acts and turn to Acts chapter 16. Look at verse 30. Here's an attitude. Now watch the attitude. Acts chapter 16. This is the last one. Acts chapter 16. And look at verse 30. Acts chapter 16, verse 30. Now watch this guy's attitude. Underline it. And 
brought them out. Let's go to verse 28. But Paul cried with a loud, but Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, now underline the attitude, Sir, what must I do to be saved? That's an attitude. You say, how do you figure it? This fellow is the Philippian jailer and he has such an attitude that he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know how long it took that fellow to get saved when he said that? That long he's saved. He's born again. He's gone, got off the road to hell and got on the road to heaven. If I could just get me a sinner to have the right attitude. Now, take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 18. I want to show you this attitude. Turn to Luke chapter 18. Oh, for the right attitude. Luke chapter 18. In the Luke chapter 18... Pick up verse 10. Now we're looking for an attitude. Luke chapter 18 verse 10 says, Two men went up to the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. And the Pharisee stood and prayed with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, an extortioner, unjust, adulterer, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And a, public, and a publican. Now let's stop a minute. The Pharisee does what? He goes up and prays and says, Thank you, Lord. I thank you that I'm not unjust. I'm a good man. I am A-OK. I'm all right. I live a good life. There's nothing wrong with me. What do you think I am? A sinner anyway? Don't! Call me a sinner. He got an attitude. You ever see somebody with an attitude? They come in the church, walk out the church. I don't you I don't like you criticizing my religion. Out the door he goes. You know what happened? Had an attitude. Now watch this guy's attitude. Look at the verse. Verse 13. And the publican standing there far off would not lift up so much as his eyes to heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. What an attitude. What an attitude. That guy gets down on his knees and says, God, oh God, I ought to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. Oh God, I ought to go to hell. I ought to go to hell. I'm a sinner. Oh God, I ought to go to hell. You know how long it took that guy to get saved? I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. He had the right attitude. Aren't you looking and praying for somebody that have the right attitude? What must I do to be saved? What kind of attitude is that? That's an attitude. I'm ready. I'm ready. I don't want to go to hell. I'm ready. How about you? You got the right kind of attitude? Let me show it to you again. Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 18. And look at verse 3. Here's the right attitude. Matthew chapter 18. Verse 3 says. And now watch it. Verse 2. 18 two, Matthew 18 two, And Jesus called a little child unto him. And set him in the midst of them. And said, Verily I say unto thee, Except ye be, be converted, underline the word be converted, and become as little children, as little children. What's the attitude? The attitude, you know what you find about little children? It's an attitude of humility. It's humble. If a man will not humble himself, God will not save him. God will never save a proud man. Man gets up and walks out the door and says, Nothing wrong with me! Walks right out that door and goes to hell. If you're here tonight, and you're lost, and you're on the road to hell, the attitude to have is, Lord, you'll save me if I ask, I'll ask. 
Every eye closed and every head bowed. Every eye closed and every head bowed. Oh, for a man to have the right attitude. Oh, for a man to have the right attitude. What is your attitude? Do you know when people get a certain attitude, you know what happens? They make the wrong decision. The road goes the other way. The crisis uh, created and his attitude changes the whole situation. God spent a whole lifetime trying to create the right attitude in you. And that attitude, I am guarantee you, is an attitude of humility to humble yourself before God. And if you're lost and you won't humble yourself and come as a sinner to the cross of Jesus, God won't save you. He only died for sinners. And to save any sinner that will come to Jesus Christ. Now you Christians, do you have some sinner that you have in mind that you'd like to see saved? Then, then get him here. This is a soul-saving business that we're in. We're in the place of seeing folks get saved and getting converted and getting their lives changed and turning to Jesus. But you've got to get you someone and bring them in. Oh, that I could encourage you to do that. You must know one on the job. You say, I can't win him on the job. Get him in church. Let the Holy Spirit convict him. Now, with every eye closed, as a Christian here, as a preacher, I know my attitude is not what it should be. And I want you to pray for me that God would help me and that God would do something in my heart and life and that God would make me different. I want you to raise your hand right now. Put it up and say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. There's several, there's several. Amen, amen. There's several all over the building. <coughs> now, Christian, you have got to get the right attitude. You've got to have the right attitude all the time. Have the attitude of the Lord. This is what's on me. I'll accept it. I'll accept it. And I'll go with it by the grace of God. I'll do your will and not my own. Take these verses and memorize them. Please, 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 please. And memorize them. And the next time you come to a crossroads in life, May those verses be right there to guide you. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for every hand that was raised this evening. Lord, you know their heart, you know their life, you know their circumstances, you know everything about them, Father. I know very little about their personal, individual lives. Lord, I know hardly nothing, but I trust by faith that they meant what they said. And Lord, please answer their prayer tonight of delivering them and giving them the attitude that would be pleasing in your sight in every matter. And Lord, if there's somebody here that's not lost, that it is lost, Lord, please speak to their heart and may they not go out that door lost and on the road to hell again. May tonight be the night of their salvation. In Jesus' precious name I pray and for his sake, amen. Let's